Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we are studying the lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for, this is actually the beginning of the second three months or the second quarter of 2014. And this particular series is entitled Christ and His Law. This first lesson in that series is entitled Laws in Christ Day, and we're going to talk about the various kind of laws under which Jesus and his disciples grew up and, and, and developed their, their lives. So you'll want to get your Bibles handy. We'll be looking at a number of verses. And while you're doing that, or when you, after you've done that, let's uh, bow our heads together and have a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we welcome you to our discussion. We thank you for the guidance that you give us through your word, through the inspired writings of Ellen White, and through our experiences such as they are. We ask now that you help us to somehow imagine ourselves in the environment in which Jesus lived so that we can better understand some of the things that they did and why they did them. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. How did Jesus relate to law in his day? And how many laws were in effect in his day? Now, we all know that to many Seventh-day Adventists, when you say the law, what is the first thing they think about? Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. And in light of that, I would like to mention these few words from Ellen White from the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven. Not here on this earth, in heaven. It has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. Great controversy, page 582, first paragraph. And why would Satan want to overthrow God's law? That's the very basis of the government of God, right? Which is that's probably... A, that's a big question, Ken. Uh, yeah. I mean, without that, uh, things would just fall apart, and not just human relationships. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, the universe would fall apart. So yeah. it kind of goes along with the question of, uh, you know, why Satan rebelled in the first place. Yeah. Oh, it was a when, fool. <coughs> when you <laughs> it was a fool, yeah. That's right. He was when an you, evolutionist. Yeah. Yeah. When you <laughs> overthrow a law... Do you automatically overthrow the lawgiver at the same time? Well, if you ignore the laws, then basically you're saying either there's reasons why we shouldn't obey these laws, or you're saying that the people that made those laws have no authority over you. Mm. Aren't you? This is all kind of... Uh, I, I, don't I don't understand, you know, talking quite this way because... Didn't even Ellen White say that when the law was given at Mount Sinai that the angels were really surprised at it? No. What Ellen White says is that when God suggested there was a law in heaven, when Satan first rebelled, that the angels were surprised. Not is that at Mount what it says? Yes. Are you Mount sure? of Blessing, page 109. Look for yourself. So, um, they knew about the law. Yeah. Well... They were surprised to know there was a law. And why is that? She, they were surprised. I thought it was at the giving of the law. Maybe I... They maybe. were so in tune with God and loved Him that they did good without even thinking of it, and they didn't even know there was a law. <coughs> no, I thought the law was there to show transgression. Well, the, you, but you don't have to have a law and explain transgression if there's no transgression. We're talking about two different laws here almost. Right. No, we're okay. talking about law, period. Satan. Okay, this is a little bit smaller print, and it's a different program, but you could see it here. But in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Nothing. thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening, something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their Creator. Obedience to them is to them no drudgery. Love for God makes their service a joy. So in every soul wherein Christ, the hope of glory, dwells, His words are re-echoed 
I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law, as within my heart. That was in heaven. Okay, but there, before Satan rebelled, they didn't know that there was a law. They didn't need a law because they just did what was right because well, it was right. Well, how can, you, how can you trip over something if it isn't there at the moment? Well, what we're saying, what we're implying by that is that there's a natural order to God's universe. There are laws that mean the law of gravity and those, those kinds of laws. There are laws that make things work. And there are people who chose to rebel against that idea. They were not self-centered. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they didn't, uh, didn't in, like in, Satan. Was the, in the case of Satan, as you're pointing yeah. out, God's government is based on love. And Satan says, I don't want to operate out of love. I want to operate out of selfishness. And, right. and that's where the conflict started. He wanted started. to be on equal footing with God. Mm -hmm. He was a created being. I mean, that took some goal right there. And he couldn't, he couldn't do that and tell the truth. Yeah. By definition, he couldn't do it and tell the truth. So he had to be deceptive. He had to mix some, the, cover the lies with with uh, with some truth to sugarcoat them. Now you, have, you have, okay, you have a law coming into being after somebody broke it. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how about people? When did they know about the law? Bef did they learn, know about the law before Sinai? Well, you're getting way ahead of us. That comes a little bit later in the lesson. So hold that okay. question because you're gonna. You're going to spoil our punch here. <laughs> we live in a world where pe we live in a world where people are constantly challenging virtually every law that you can imagine. Just as Satan did, people want to change the law. They 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 want to change the way people get married. They want to change the way you know people drive. They want to change. I mean, any law that you can imagine, they want to change it. I like now, to make a distinction between uh, driving and marriage and, those, as, and call those rules and regulations and statutes as a, and, and, and make a distinction as opposed to what real law is. Yeah. Law is the lo real law is love, and the, and the subheadings are what we call the Ten Commandments, which are really descriptive of the way things really work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you, you don't have to, it's not a law that you drive 65. I mean, that's a rule and a regulation based upon certain conditions. But and it's, it's been changed, we know. Yeah. It can be changed. But it's not a But if, <laughs> if we, really, if we li really live in a world that came from evolution, then it's an amoral world. Right. There is no basis for morality if we come from an evolutionary background. Now, we're not saying immoral meaning like bad morals. We're saying amoral, there just aren't any morals. There's, there's no basis for saying something's right and wrong if you have an evolutionary you know, background. Now, the evolutionists won't agree with that. They'll say, well, there are certain things that are naturally right. I mean, it doesn't seem right to kill your neighbor because he might kill you back if he has a chance or try. <laughs> um, but... Um, if God, we, Christians would say, if God doesn't exist as we believe, then knowing what is right and wrong and what is good and bad comes from our understanding of his character and his government. We base our ideas of morality, of right and wrong, on our understanding of God. Now, now has it always been that way? Yeah. Yes. Well, we'll Before Satan sinned, was it that way? Was there an they actual lived. conscious thing they, that I got these rules I got to live by no. or else I'm going to get in trouble? No, they, what happened in those days is they, they loved God and they said, what can I do to please Him? What can I do to make Him happy? What can I do to make other people happy? How can I serve others? That was the question. Well, you know, I saw this precious relationship between a mother and a little girl about six years old. And the little girl was picking up all the stuff to help the mother put away uh, the stuff that we were using for exercise class. And she was going around picking it up. And it was her delight. Her mother didn't even say, would you pick up? She knew what needed to be done and she did it. It was her delight. Mm -hmm. Now, some other little kid could come in there and say, do you know there's a rule you have to do that? And by the way, that rule isn't fun to follow. And why are you doing that? And, and could it come and turn that really little it. yeah and but the little girl didn't even know that there was a rule that little kids had to pick up you know 
And she was just doing it because she loved her mother. Okay, let's make a very clear distinction. Jim was already, mm -hmm. you know, sort of pointed in this direction. There are two very distinctly different kinds of laws. There are proscriptive laws. Proscriptive laws mean, okay, someone in authority decides that something should happen in a certain way and they write a law. And therefore, after they write the law and it's approved, they expect people to obey it because they say so. Okay? There's another whole group of laws that are called descriptive laws. One of the obvious examples of that is the law of gravity. Now, none of us has the opportunity to change the law of gravity. Don't even try it. You, the results will be sad, you know. Uh, so, what about that? Uh, the law, God's law now, the Ten Commandments and the rest of the laws that govern his universe, are they proscriptive laws? God says, I'm laying down the law here and you better do it. If you don't do it, you're going to be in trouble. Or are they descriptive laws? That is, God says, here's the way things work naturally under the ideal circumstances in our universe. What do you think? His laws are definitely descriptive. Mm -hmm. um, it's a law that if you break, I mean, it's, it's a consequence. It's mm -hmm. a consequence that God is warning about. If you break one of God's laws, this is the consequence that is going to happen to you. You step off, you step off of a building and you're going to fall flat on the ground. You, can't, which, you don't have the choice of, of... Which I wish would have been explained to me many, many years ago because I had to find out for myself that they were not proscriptive and you could rebel against them and change them and, and, and even society in the 60s wanted to change them. But they are descriptive laws like gravity, and you cannot change um, the consequences of God's law. Well, okay. Uh, the, um, yeah, the consequences, they're, they're very consistent. The cause and effect is very consistent. And if it wasn't consistent, there would be no reason to have a law because it, be a it law. would be meaningless. Yeah. And I suppose that um, that's what we learn. We I'm, try I'm, to learn. How many different laws do we have to obey living here in Southern California? We have federal laws. We have state laws. We have county laws. They do taxing and so forth based on the county laws or city laws sometimes. And then there are ordinances of various kinds. We are subject to all these laws and on some occasions they conflict with each other. We know that. I mean, here we have uh, states now that are voting to make marijuana legal when the federal government says it's illegal. And it may violate a descriptive law and have a consequence that is going to be found out later. Mm -hmm. So now, since we're talking about Jesus here, how many different laws did he live under? Roman law and Jewish Roman law. Roman law for sure. Jewish law. Jewish law. Now by Jewish law we're talking about rules made by the Sanhedrin and rules that govern the operation at the temple. That would include the temple tax and that kind of stuff, right? What other rules? You lived by those? Well, he lived under them. How, lived he, under how them. he responded to them. We're going to talk about how he responded to them. But Oh, you mean they were around? They were, they were yeah. rules that he was yeah, supposed to be living under. Okay. What other ones can you think about? What about Herod? Wasn't he subject, supposed to be a subject of Herod's? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, was Herod a Roman? No, Herod was, was an Edomian. He, he came from a mixture of Edomites and, and, and Jews. He had connections. So he, he had um, his own little laws then yeah. for his kingdom, okay? Yeah. It'd be like county laws, city laws, yeah. homeowners association laws yeah. and mm -hmm. rules. Well, they had the Talbudic. Uh, Mishnah type laws yeah. that he, there were, whether he subscribed to them or not. That's yeah. good. Well, look at Luke 2, 1 to 5, just as an interesting example. <clears throat> Luke 2, 1 to 5. At that time, the Emperor Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the Roman Empire. When this first census took place, Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Quirinius is our governor of Syria. Everyone then went to register himself each to his own town. 
Joseph went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the birthplace of King David. Joseph went there because he was a descendant of David. And of course we know, who did he take with him? Mary. He took Mary that he was betrothed to because she was? Great child. Great with child and about to have a baby. And the baby was born in Bethlehem. So why did they go down there? There was a law. There was a Roman law. And Jesus was obeying the Roman law even before he was born, basically. He was transported by donkey from Galilee to Bethlehem, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> obeying, what's your point at obey, uh, well, of obeying? I'm just saying Jesus was born under these laws. Okay. Yeah. So what about it now? Um, do we need to understand something about the laws and the codes of the Romans? Does that help us to understand things that were going on in Jesus' day? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you think of times when some of the apostles appealed to their Romanness or their Jewishness to help protect them, and other times that those those things were a real danger to them? Mm -hmm. I mean, think of the times when Paul said, "I'm a Roman citizen," and it protected him. I appeal to Caesar, protected him. But there are other times, well, like the end, ended up cutting off his head, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what about the arrest and torture and crucifixion of Jesus? What laws did that happen under? Mm, he was well, he was acquitted by the, the, the laws, mm -hmm. the, the law system, but it was a mob mm -hmm. That, that demanded there was death. And there was no law that, that he had broken. No. He was a uh, judge he, not guilty. He was rejected, just basically. Mm -hmm. rejected. Yeah, but it was a mob. It was, uh, yeah, the, job, the mob rejected. It was a democracy that, that saw to it that he was killed. Democracy? Yeah. Mob <laughs> rule. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you for speaking well, of the democracy. <laughs> Never heard of it defined quite that way. But well, I mean, kind of when you think show me that's it. wrong. Well, the Sanhedrin, or the council, let's talk about them now, John eleven forty seven and Acts five twenty seven, consisted of 71 men selected from among the priests and the leading families of Judah and Galilee and rabbis. Okay. The high priest was the presiding officer. The members of the Sanhedrin were supposed to base all of their discussions and laws on the five books of Moses. Why was that? Well, that was their Bible at the time. Well, no, they not all of it. They were given by God. What? They were given by God. Well, that's just the, the five that. books of Moses? Yeah. But there's another reason why they stuck with the five books of Moses. The Sadducees did not believe in any of the rest of the Bible. The only part of the Bible they accepted was the five books of Moses. So if you have a, a court that's ruled over by a Sadducee and a significant portion of the members are Sadducees, you have to limit yourself to the five books of Moses. So anything after Deuteronomy doesn't count in the Sanhedrin. You need to remember that. So what were the five books of Moses called in the Jewish language? Law. Hebrew language? They were called... We, we translate it into law as in English. It, in Hebrew, it was called Torah. In Greek, it was namas. So in the New Testament, when they talk about the law and the prophets, mm -hmm. is that what they're talking about, is those five Well, books? let's talk about that for a little bit. We, don't have, we shouldn't take a long time, but it's a, it can be confusing in the New Testament because sometimes when they said law, they're clearly referring to the Ten Commandments. Sometimes when they said law, they were clearly referring to the five books of Moses. Sometimes when they said law, they were thinking about the entire Old Testament. Jesus on one occasion said, in your law, it says, and he's referring to Psalms. So he clearly included, but sometimes he said, in, your, in the law and the prophets, it says. So then he was including the law and the prophets meant the whole Old Testament. And sometimes, he, a few occasions, he said the Law of Prophets and the Psalms. So he included all three of the ca recognized categories that the Jews had for the Bible. He mentioned all three of them. So, well, look at some of the rules they were expected to obey. 
Jewish men were still expected to pay the half shekel temple tax, Matthew 17, 24 to 27, and Exodus 30, 13. Divorces were still being governed by the stipulations set forth by Moses. We know about Matthew 19, 7 and Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4, and remember even John 8. People still adhered to the law of leveret marriage, in which a widow was to marry a brother's a husband's brother, Matthew 24, 22, 24, and Deuteronomy 25, 5. I have a question. Yeah. What if he already had a wife? No, he, would ex he was expected to take on and be responsible for a second wife. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. For, and support her financially. Okay. Yeah. Boys were still circumcised on the eighth day, John 7, 23, Leviticus 12, 3. And adulterers were to be punished by stoning. And here we come to John 8. Deuteronomy 22. And these would be laws pertaining to the Jewish culture, yes. not the Roman. No, these are the Jewish culture now. So in major civil and criminal cases, Jewish law required that there be at least two witnesses. Lots of reference, a lot of passages suggesting that. Some of the Mosaic laws seem quite strange to us. For example, <coughs> consider the rules of laws and rules and laws in Deuteronomy 21 and Numbers 5. There's some really strange ones there. I mean, how do you find out whether a woman is cheating, you know? You bring it the ashes and you go through this process and she puts her hands in it and she da-da-da. Crazy stuff, it seems to us. So, um, so in the Mosaic Law, if we're going to include the five books of Moses, there were different kinds of commandments in, involved in, ver involving various aspects of life. There was the moral law of the Ten Commandments. We all know about that. There were the ceremonial laws governing sacrifices, etc. But there were also health laws. There were civil laws. There were marching laws. There were a whole bunch of different kinds of laws. Ellen White made some very interesting statements about why all these laws were given. And Gary, your question. Here it is. If Adam had not transgressed the law of God, how far back is that? Way back. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, right? If Adam had not transgressed the law of God, the ceremonial law would never have been instituted. Where was it instituted? Outside the gates. They offered their first sacrifices, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Okay. The gospel of good news was first given to Adam in the declaration made to him that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. And it was handed down to successive generations to Noah... Abraham, and Moses. The knowledge of God's law and the plan of salvation were imparted to Adam and Eve by Christ himself. They carefully treasured the important lesson and transmitted it by word of mouth to their children and children's children. Thus the knowledge of God's law was preserved. Signs of the Times, March 14, 1878, and Selected Messages, Book 1, page 230. So those, those laws that were written down on the stone had been said before? Had been spoken. I mean, we just it, we have, we have Alan White's words here, suggesting that at least some of them were actually spoken by Christ himself to Adam and Eve. Yeah, it's, it's and then kind passed of down. I don't know what that means, though. I mean, I, I, I know that the concepts of the laws yeah. are there. There's no doubt about that. But it said ceremonial, didn't it there? It back back well, up a little said, bit. Yeah. If Adam had not transgressed the law of God, the ceremonial law would never have been instituted. Right. So, okay, well, let me, let me expand. I, want to, I did a lot of work on this lesson. I want to take advantage of this, okay? Mm -hmm. now the ceremonial law, meaning the sacrificial Prim law? Primarily or involving sacrifices. Okay. Yeah. Not necessarily the marriage laws no. and cleansing of... Yeah. Okay. okay, look at this. If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, now that's not Christ himself giving it to them in the garden. This is after the fall. Preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, Genesis 26, verse 5, if I remember correctly, says he taught, his, taught the laws to children. There would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. So now we're going the next step. See, It was necessary because they weren't obeying the laws that had been given to them. And if the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant 
of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. Why, were, why did they have to go down and become slaves in Egypt? Because they didn't observe the law given to their grandfather. They would have kept God's law in mind, and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon the tables of stone. What law is that? The moral law. The moral law. It would not have been necessary if what? If they had obeyed the laws that God had already given. So now he says, you don't, well, and, and let's just look at the background of this. In the days of the Egyptians, and that we, we could have said the same thing about the people over in, in Mesopotamia at the same time. <clears throat> Something that's really important, it's carved into stone. So what does God do? The Ten Commandments are really important. He carves them into stone. Okay? And by wasn't needed or wasn't necessary, that doesn't mean that these are new laws. No. It means they're stated. that they're having to be um, enunciated in a more... Spelled out. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, there, there's one thing... That, I don't know if she started at the right place. Why? <laughs> because well, if I Satan hadn't have sinned, it there would, would be no reason for the whole thing. That's true. Exactly. So you go all the way down to all those, those yeah. steps, starting with Satan. <laughs> it's, it's going down, 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 down. Mm -hmm. it's, you can break that chain. Yeah. Look, at, and, and let's say that Satan, that Adam didn't sin, that he didn't break the law. Mm -hmm. We would still be in the Garden of Eden. What would have happened to the accusations about God? How would they have been dealt with? Well, we have very little information about that. All we have to go by is anything that's in the Bible, which is all, virtually nothing, and some few words from Ellen White. Somehow or other, Satan's accusations would have had to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And God would have figured out a way to do that. Would have figured out a way to do that. Well, Some people have suggested that Christ's sacrifice, Christ's death, would have been like he would have been sacrificed on an altar. Would have been sacrificed a, on an altar? Some have suggested that as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, like, like the lambs were sacrificed. Slaughter. And that would do it? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know how that would work out. I'm just, you asked the... What we're doing is well, a hypothetical question. Well, and I'm this whole thing is hypothetical because, you know, all this stuff did not happen. It did happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so actually it's it is the providence of God right there. Well, let me read the last part of that. Okay. And had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, in other words, that's what's written on the tables of stone, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. Patriarchs and Prophets, 364. Now the there's principles a, of the Ten Commandments are really no self-centeredness. Yeah. Yeah. And are the you, interesting thing... Are you saying that God is giving descriptive laws, mm -hmm. and because people keep violating the descriptive laws, He has to give some proscriptive laws to keep people on the track of His descriptive laws and if we would just get the idea to keep the descriptive laws, yep. we would be in fine shape. The very interesting thing about that, and we don't even have a minute or two to do dedicate to this, but there was a huge conflict in the 1888 General Conference and Seventh-day Adventists, many of you will know about that, about which law was added in the book of Galatians. Galatians 3, 19 to 25. This information that I just read you is actually a condensation of a two or three paragraph version of this same story in the book Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. And Ellen White gave the answers to that whole question in 1870. 18 years, I believe it was 1870. Eight, something like 18 years before the 1880 General Conference. Why did they have to sit down and almost have a knockdown, drag out fight over that 
when Ellen White had clearly answered the question many years before. Well, it was were a new they, generation. Yeah. Were they ignoring her? Yes. Hasn't, <laughs> wasn't it true that wasn't um, James and Wagner, Jones, Jones, and Wagner. Jones and Wagner, happening uh, sometime after that? No, that was when they right about their time. Right about, their time. about 1888, though. That's when they really okay. put out their their. Um, okay. And their again, theology. I'm not going to take a long time on this. The General Conference, well, Jones and Wagner started, they were the co-editors of the Science of the Times on the West Coast. They were also teaching at our college in California. They started teaching some lessons about righteousness by faith and that kind of stuff. And this stirred up some people who weren't happy about this moving away from the law as the, the final word. Okay, And so G.I. Butler, George I. Butler, wrote a book against this, explaining all the reasons why what they were teaching was wrong. Um, it came out in 1880, the end of 1885, if I'm not mistaken. Was he president of the GC? At he the was time? president of the General Conference. In 1887, this was a, two years later, Dr. Wagner, he was a physician as well as a preacher, and he was the creditor of the Science of the Times, said, you know, I have kept quiet about this, but I think Elder Butler's book needs to be responded to. And he wrote a book entitled The Gospel in Galatians. And he just tore Elder Butler's book to pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's what led, they said, you know, that's what led the, to the discussions in 1888. Now, were Jones and Wagner, because I'm not familiar with this, talking about the descriptive law? And Butler was talking about the proscriptive law? Partly. But their focus was on Galatians 3 and which law was added. And this quotation says basically all laws were added. And Ellen White finally ended up saying it was all law. It was all what? In 1896 and 1900. She finally just says, you guys don't get it. Let me just say it as bluntly as I can. But it wasn't until, what, about 50 years later that that statement came out. Yes. So okay. now we're, okay, we're, shall we get back to the lesson then? Are we to, are we to understand, oh. is it to be intimated that, um, that when you don't follow the law, um, you get to a point where you don't understand it, and yes. so it has to be um, Reiterated. more defined mm -hmm. in almost more elementary terms? Yes. And so we're not getting a bunch of new laws. We're getting the same law. It's just um, being produced at a level that is necessary in order to convey the information to the contemporary generation. Very good. Generation. You just made my next we're, point. We're getting stupider and stupider. Mm -hmm. Is that it? <laughs> well, here I asked a question. Would it be correct to say that the more closely we obey and follow God's laws, the less we need them? Remember that Paul said that the law was added, Galatians 3, and that was the big argument. I mean, how could you say that the Ten Commandment law, which was the, you know, based on God's character, how could you say that law was added? What you're, what you're saying is, is if we were doing the right thing, we wouldn't necessarily need the code book. We wouldn't. You know, I We'd the, just be doing it and therefore wouldn't need to be spelled out. The teachers in our school, I think they called it the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. That you have a spirit of the law you should follow. And when you don't follow that spirit of the law, then all of a sudden the administrators and whoever have to make all these little tiny laws mm -hmm. to try to get you to follow the spirit of the law. Yeah. So the laws are for people who break them. Yes, that's what Paul says exactly in Timothy. And then the people who follow the spirit of the law get frustrated because all of a sudden they've got all these laws. Mm -hmm. The code books are yes. for the people yes. who, who break the law. In Christ's day, the Jewish people also tried to follow a large collection of oral laws known as the rabbinic law. In Hebrew, this oral law was known as the halakha. The plural is halakoth, okay. which means to walk the way you're supposed to walk, in other words. Over the years, the Jewish rabbis had determined that there were 613 major laws spelled out in the books of Moses. 613. 
a number of those laws came to be known as the Midrash. And some of those laws regarded as more important were written down in a collection called the Mishnah. So you got all those names straight? Halakha, Halakoth, the Midrash, the Mishnah. Surely all of us recognize that the Jews were particularly careful in Sabbath keeping. So let's see what we can learn about the laws. They were constantly accusing Christ of breaking their Sabbath rules. What were their Sabbath rules? By the way, let me just interrupt here for a second. If you're interested in some of this material and you don't, have to, don't want to dig it all out for yourself, these handouts are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. It should, prefer, should, it should result in some very interesting discussions in your Sabbath school class, I would think, also. So what were their Sabbath rules? Many of those rules had been preserved in the Jewish volume called the Mishnah that we've mentioned. The Oxford University Press produced an English translation of the Mishnah, giving us some of those details in English. First, however, note that in giving the fourth commandment, God said simply, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In it thou shalt not do any work. But he didn't tell them what work was. And he doesn't tell them what he had in mind. So they set about to solve the problem. So in the Mishnah, in the Oxford University Version, page 106, it says, quote, The main classes of work are 40, save one. So 39, okay? Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, cleansing crops, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing wool, washing or beating, or dyeing, or dyeing the wool, spinning, weaving, making two loops. One would be all right, but not two. Now, are you being really careful about all these things? Weaving two threads, separating two threads, tying a knot, loosening a knot, sewing two stitches. If the button just fell off a Sabbath suit on the way to church and it is our pastor, he does not want to look untidy in the pulpit, that's too bad. He cannot sew it on. Tearing in order to sew two stitches, hunting a gazelle, slaughtering or flaying or salting it or curing its skin, scraping or cutting it up, writing two letters, Erasing in order to write two letters, building, pulling down. I'm telling you, these are the 39 rules, okay? Putting out a fire, lighting a fire. And by the way, that's why you can't light a light. A Jew, a modern Jew, can't turn on a switch to light a light. That's a version of form of lighting a fire. Or you can't push a button on an elevator. There's a right. spark back there. Right. Striking with a hammer or taking out ought from one domain into another. These are the main classes of work, 40 save one. Okay. They were very sincere about wanting to follow God. Yeah. But re it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How come they didn't define holy in 40, yeah. s 40 ways? They just defined work. So they left off a definition of holy. What happened to them was what happens to us here in this country. You make a rule and then say, well, what about this? So you add, and then what about that? And then you add, and what about this? And you add, what about that? And you add, and pretty soon it just becomes a hodgepodge. So here's what happened in the hodgepodge. In the footnote, it says, these 39 acts of work are treated in various degrees of detail in chapters 11 and following. Okay, this is in the Mishnah now. So what are those details? Consider this law. Now, it would be good if we had time to look at a lot of them. A lot of them are pretty obvious things, no big deal, but some of them seem a little crazy to us, so I'm going to pick an example. I'm glad they weren't the 27 fundamental ones. <laughs> okay. They could grow to that, though. Okay. <coughs> Bathing on the Sabbath and drying off. Okay, here's the rule about that. If a man bathed in the water of a cave or in the water of Tiberias, Tiberias is another name for the Sea of Galilee, and dried himself, even though it was with ten towels, he may not bring them away in his hand. Okay, that's the basic rule. Well, what would that mean? So there's a footnote. From fear of offending against the principle of squeezing out however little the moisture in them. So you're not, it's, not, it's not the problem with carrying the towels away. It's not the problem with drying yourself off. It's not the problem with bathing. The problem is if you carry the towel home, you might squeeze some water out of it. Then you see the point. You're not allowed to squeeze a towel on the Sabbath. But you want to dry yourself. 
Well, use 10 towels and none of them will get very wet and you will not by mistake squeeze them. But no, that is forbidden. So the rule goes on, and I quote, but if 10 men dried themselves with one towel, then it would be very wet, wouldn't it? Wiping their faces, their hands, and their feet, they may bring the towel away in their hands. Now, how could that be? So many men would keep each other warned of the danger of squeezing. <laughs> <laughs> so they would, carry, they would carry it by a corner or something? I don't, I, one wouldn't dare dare squeeze it in front of all those other nine. All the other. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me hard to focus on. <laughs> okay. It would be much safer for ten people to use one towel and get it very wet because they would remind each other that they must not squeeze it. But if one man used ten towels, even though the towels would not be very wet, there's a danger he would forget and squeeze one of them. Remember that the next time. <laughs> <laughs> that Mishnah is uh, published by Oxford uh, University Press is thicker than this Bible that has the apocrypha in it. Yeah. It is, it, and it's thin paper. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a lot of details. Yeah, yeah. What you can do? What happens if you're carrying a load? Your donkey is carrying a load, and you're rushing home before the Sabbath, and on and on. It's there's some incredible stuff. Well, is I it, remember growing up. There was some rules that were kind of weird yeah. I had to deal with, too. Yeah. Is, it, is it any wonder, then, that Jesus seemed to go out of his way to break their man-made rules while keeping God's rules? Look at Luke 14, 1 to 6, for example. One Sabbath, Jesus went to eat a meal at the home of one of the leading Pharisees. Now, he probably had healed a man or something like that, but he was welcome. He was invited to this Pharisee's home. And people were watching Jesus closely. A man whose legs and arms were swollen came to Jesus, and Jesus asked the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. They're all gathered around, so Jesus turns to them and says, Does our law allow healing on the Sabbath or not? Pretty simple question, right? <coughs> Nobody answered. But they would not say anything, because they knew that anything they said would be used against them. No. Years ago, when I was studying with a rabbi for a while, he, uh, Rome, excuse me, Ephesians 2, 14, he says, For he is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances. And he re held up the mission to, uh, su uh, I see. As a, to support what he was saying. It was just all those rules and regulation, it just was such a burden that and nobody could... Anyway. Jesus took the man healed him, and sent him away. Then he said to them, If any one of you had a son or an ox that happened to fall in a well on the Sabbath, would you not pull them out at once on the Sabbath itself? But they were not able to answer him about this. I mean, they knew perfectly well what they would do. They knew exactly what they would do. Right? He probably had an example he could have quoted right there. And of course, John 9, where he healed the blind man and all this kind of stuff. Well, but of course, the man could have been healed. He wasn't in a well. He wasn't drowning. He could have been, he could have been healed the next day. But your son that fell in the well, he could probably stay there until the next day, and you could pull him out on, the, on a Sunday. <laughs> Unless it was too deep. Well, Seventh-day Adventists continue to observe the Seventh-day Sabbath. Most of our Christian friends do not. They look at the many miracles Jesus performed on the Sabbath and suggest that he was doing away with the Sabbath commandment. Is that true? Is, is observing the Sabbath a descriptive law or a proscriptive law? Descriptive. Well, the Sabbath is a part of the Ten Commandments. So We have suggested that's a descriptive law. In, let's just stop and ask that question for a moment. In what way is the Sabbath a descriptive law? Well, it was in Isaiah talks about you from one Sabbath to another. It's a time for learning. God says we're going to get together once a week. That's one way to interpret it. So, yeah. okay. and we all need instruction. And He says you obey. Well, obey means you've taken some instruction. You thought it was valuable, and so you followed. Uh, so the Sabbath is like gravity. Yeah. I always had a question about the uh, what you just quoted. When he talked about one Sabbath to the next, was he talking about 
highlighting Sabbath or time period? Well, it says Sabbath, and it's a regular word for Sabbath. Okay, what was it but the Bible that does say Sabbaths, too. On some occasions, when yeah. he's talking about... Cause so you can't really zero in on one well, meaning. But he, he talks about, in that verse in Isaiah, it talks about from one, one new moon to another and mm -hmm. one Sabbath to another. So he's, he deals with a lot of those other Sabbaths separately. Yeah, but they're all called Sabbath. Yeah, but he, he, he names them by a different name. Well, here, here's, let me just say a word or two, and let me help Jim, if I may. This, he, we human beings need to be able to look up to something above ourselves. We need to consider that person, that whatever it is, of, a, of supreme worth. If you consider something of a supreme worth, you are, in effect, worshiping it. That's what worship means. It means you hold this thing to be of great worth. Isn't we that need the first that. Commandment, though? What? That's the first commandment. That's though. part of the first commandment. That is the first commandment. It is the first commandment. Love your God okay. with all your heart and with all your mind. And with right. all, everything, that means everything you've ever done, all days, every day, yeah. all the I'll time. I'll argue with you. Okay. But God says you can very easily get so busy with all your personal responsibilities, your job responsibilities, etc., that you lose track of me. So I set aside a time when you stop everything else and you're focusing on, you focus on me. We will get together. I will give you a special blessing on that day and we will make that day the Sabbath. That's why that parent-child uh, description, it makes mm -hmm. so, so much sense because a parent has a duty to teach his kids. Mm -hmm. And that's what he wants to do. We're talking about the infinite one and we're finite. Mm -hmm. uh, what can we know? And we're going to learn for eternity. So it's, it's something we might as well get used to and get started now. So what are, what were we, what are we supposed to learn from Jesus' doing all those unnecessary healings on the Sabbath? We learn about God and, and His graciousness and, and, and some of His cap, uh, abilities and, and powers and so forth. You don't okay. stop doing Be, good on the all. Sabbath. It was exactly. Well, Jesus is trying to tell us something, and that I'm not arguing about what either one of you said, but there's something more important than that. Well, no, I, maybe I shouldn't say more important. There's something else that Jesus was very specifically doing. He was putting the this Sabbath in, in the right context. He was doing away with all the Mishnah rules. Exactly. Yeah. He was doing away with all them. He was intentionally breaking those rules, forcing people to say, okay, which am I going to choose? The, the Ten Commandments or I'm going to choose the Mishnah rules? Ten Commandments, Mishnah rules. That's what he was forcing to do. That's that dividing wall of ordinances and, and the statutes that created hostility. Well, almost anyone who studies the Bible carefully will recognize that the Jewish people, especially the Pharisees, required a meticulous keeping of the Ten Commandments as they understood them. There is a whole section in the Mishnah called the Tamid. It's in section 5, starting with paragraph 1, saying that faithful Jews should recite the Ten Commandments every day. If, according to this rule, if you're a faithful Jew, you should re recite the Ten Commandments by memory every day. They believed that all of the laws depended on or were derived from the Ten Commandments. And I know... We wouldn't have a problem with that. I know a Sunday church denomination that at before, after the beginning is of church, before the preacher speaks, he has a reading of the Ten Commandments and then he starts his preaching. And I always wondered why Adventist churches didn't do that. It's just kind of nice to sit there and every week these people hear the Ten Commandments again. Well, well Ellen, Ellen White's, you know, go ahead. Ellen White says that uh, you should spend an hour each day contemplating the life of Christ. And she says also that it would be very profitable for us on some, some Sabbath occasions just to hear the Bible read well. So now is, uh, is this hour a day? Is that, is that our Mishnah now? We need well, to I hope not. 
A Mishnah means you add laws to add laws to add laws to add laws and define well, it and spell that, it out and so forth. We didn't have that before. Now that we have her, we have that. So These are stories. Yeah. This is a, bunch, a whole lot of stories and how this things work. We learn how things work. A bunch of codes and rules and regulations it just burden you. You never know it when you're tripping up. It's almost obsessive compulsive. You get yeah. yourself into a whole <laughs> that con contemplation and letting it soak yeah. into your brain is a different thing. And you got to remember that every time you shower. <laughs> you don't squeeze the towel. <laughs> it's kind of sad when you think about it. On one occasion, Jesus was asked what was the greatest commandment, and Gary's already pointed out Matthew 19, 16 to 19, Romans 13, 8 to 10, and James 2, 8 to 12. Talk about the Ten Commandments, and then they say those Ten Commandments can be broken down into two, and what are the two? Love God. love God and love your fellow man, right? And those two can be further summarized by a single word, love. love. Romans 13, let's read that one particularly. Romans 13, 8 to 10, but be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. Now you're going to stop and say, okay, what law was he talking about? The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not desire what belongs to someone else. All these and any others besides are summed up in the one command, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you love someone, you will never do them wrong. To love then is to obey how much of the law? The whole law. The whole law. Is that clear? I don't know how it could be more clear than that. Well... It should be obvious to all of us that any society that is going to survive must have some rules and laws that are agreed upon. So where do societies get the idea of what is right and what is wrong? I think we're trying our very best to, at this point in, in history, trying to do away with everything and just saying whatever you feel like is right. Well, I have a Baptist friend who asked me, he says, do you remember what year it was when the Bible quit being the standard for our country? And I says, I don't know, it seemed to happen somewhere along the way. Mm -hmm. Well, even more or less atheistic societies, such as the communist governments that we are familiar with, have plenty of laws. And remember, Orwell wrote his book, yeah. and he said, and some animals are more equal than others. Okay. Shouldn't laws be designed to help us live together peacefully and safely? Would you agree that the Ten Commandments understood correctly and fully form the basis of all moral law? Absolutely. Is keeping the Ten Commandments something that we do naturally? Be careful. Not naturally. It's not natural for selfish human beings to obey the Ten Commandments. Well, it's not really our character. It's no. God's character. Yeah. And Jesus said... There's no one good but God. And little kids have to be told. Yeah. Well, should Christians always feel comfortable observing the Ten Commandments? Yes. Why is it that at times we don't feel very comfortable observing the Ten Commandments? Because we don't do very good at it. Remember, we're born with selfish natures, and the Ten Commandments are summarized by the two and by the command to love. They're just the opposite of selfishness. So each one of us must con constantly struggle between our natural selfishness and the laws of love which we believe God has given us. There we are. Well, if you were assigned the task of setting up a new society, a new government perhaps, are there any of the Ten Commandments that would, you would want to leave out? No. no. Would you like to say it's all right to murder? No. Would you like to say it's all right to steal? No. Would you like to say it's all right to worship idols? What would be wrong with that? Shouldn't people be allowed freedom to worship whoever they want? You become like what you worship or admire. Well, yeah. you have the freedom to do it, but you have, you're going to get the com you're going to get the consequences. Yeah. Is an uh, idol just an extension of yourself, and then that person would eventually start? Thinking Often. that they were the God and that God was under their control? There are various ways in which people have looked at God's commandments over the generations. Even in our day, many people believe that the Bible is full of do's and don'ts, 
deeds to be done and sins to be done, they regard the Bible as a kind of blueprint. Others regard the scriptures with all its stories, rules, and laws as primarily a description of how we are to be saved. In other words, it's a, the gospel. How we're to be, They look for laws, rules, and statements about God's love and the plan of salvation. Still others, with perhaps a deeper knowledge of scripture, see the scriptures as the story of God and his dealings with his sinful and rebellious children down through the generations. It is primarily a story about God. Jim, here you go. So how do we feel about God's laws and his commandments? If you are a believer, listen to these, if you are a believer and are seeking to do God's will, what makes you willing to obey? Could you say, I do what I do because God has told me to and he has the power to reward and destroy? Is that why you don't murder or commit adultery because God has said you mustn't? You would otherwise, but you can't afford to incur his displeasure. This might be all right for a beginner or a little child, but it suggests that God's laws are arbitrary and do not make good sense in themselves. That does not speak very favorably of God. Would you rather say, I do what I do as a believer because God has told me to and I love him and I want to please him? Is that why you don't steal or tell lies? You would see nothing wrong or harmful about doing these things. It's just that you want so much to please God. For some reason, he does not like it when you steal or lie, and since he has been so good to us, you feel under obligation to please him. It would only be grateful and fair, right? Again, this might be all right for a beginner or child. It might even be progress beyond the obedience prompted by, only by fear of punishment and desire for, of reward. But it still implies an arbitrariness in God's commandments and does not speak so well of his character and government. There is another possible approach to obedience. Could you say this? I do what I do because I have found it to be right and sensible to do so. And I have increasing admiration and reverence for the one who so advised and commanded me in the days of my ignorance and immaturity. Then hastening to add, being still somewhat ignorant and immature, let's be honest, I am willing to trust and obey the one who whose counsel has always proved to be so sensible when he commands me to do something beyond my present understanding. And those last few comments were taken from a little book, I Want to Be Free, by A. Graham Maxwell. It's pages 33 and 34. So what do you think Ellen White had in mind when she talked about the law that should not be looked, for, looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the mercy side? I'm going to leave that question from you, for you. If you want to read the rest of it, it's in Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 235, and you'd like to read all around it. So how do you regard the law of God? 